Sound check one. Sound check two.
Okay, let's get started. So this is a live chat for my MGF 1106 class. Uh-oh, I might be having sound problems here. Hold on. Sound check three. Okay, I think we're good. All right, so I'm um, going to just type a message here that if anybody logs in and you can't hear me, please type and let me know because we have started. So um, for my math for, well, actually it's uh, foundations of mathematical reasoning class, um, we're talking about statistics and we're actually in chapter six, section two. We had left off with the weighted mean and I just want to remind you what we were talking about in class. Um, when you have a situation where each data value that you're, if you're asked to take a mean or an average, you normally add up all the data values and divide by the number of data values. Well. Sometimes, instead of listing each data value separately, if we have multiple copies, we'll tell you the frequency, how many times they occur. And instead of adding them up, like for example, here we have data um, for uh, salaries, right? And we have one manager making 28,600, and we have a salesperson making 17,500. Actually, we have five salespeople. But instead of listing uh, 17,500 five times, uh, we're going to just say, okay, there's five of them that have that salary. So when we find the average, instead of adding up 17,500 five times, you know, we've known for a long time since we were little kids to, when we learned how to multiply, that instead of adding it up five times, we can just multiply by five. So that's what we're gonna do when we're finding the mean. We're gonna multiply the frequency times the data value. So when we're given this data here, we have to first figure out which is the frequency and which is the data value. So the salary column is the data values and the number column tells you how often those occur. So those are your frequencies. So we're gonna arrange these in a table with an extra column for, uh, to give us space to multiply those values together because we're trying to find the mean. So we have, I've rewritten them here and we have the data values column. Remember X always represents the data values. Let me get myself a little pointer here. X always represents data values. In statistics, F represents frequencies. And then we have a column here for the product of X and F, X times F. So um, there's only one manager, so one times 28.6 is still 28.6, but there's five salespersons. So altogether they're getting paid uh, five times 17,500 is 87,500. There are three secretaries at 15,100, so that's 45,300 being paid out. There's one custodian paid 13,000. So what, to find the average, we need to divide the total amount of money paid out by the number of employees. And really I should say mean, not average, but it's the same idea. So we're going to um, add up the frequencies to figure out how many employees there are, that's 10. We're gonna add up all of the um, X times F values to see what, how much the total amount the company pays. Out. And then we're gonna divide those two to find the average. And it turns out the average salary is 17,440 for this company. Notice that it's very close to 17,500, which kind of makes sense because um, we had one manager making 28,600. And then we had just a few people making down a little bit below 17,500. 
And then we had a bunch of people that were making 17,500. So they have a big impact on what the average turns out to be. We also talked about how to find this on a calculator. In particular, we were using the TI-30X2S calculator. I showed you how to enter data in the calculator by um, selecting second stat. So the second button is uh, the usually blue button and then uh, up the stat is above the data button. So you hit second stat and what you're gonna see on the screen is one var, two var. One var should already be underlined, meaning selected. So you hit enter and then you're gonna hit data again, the data button again. And what you should see is that your calculator is going to ask you for X1, data value one. So you're gonna put in 28,600. This little V shape I have typed here, that's my way of saying arrow down. So after you enter 28,600, you arrow down and you're going to be asked for the frequency. Now the calculator will assume the frequency is one unless you tell. So right now it should say one on your screen, but then um, in this case, the manager was the only one making that salary. So that's good. So we don't need to change it. So we're just going to arrow down again. And then it's going to ask you for X2, which is the second data value, 17,500, arrow down again. It asked you for the frequency. There were five salespersons making that salary. So enter five, then arrow down again. It asked you for the third data value, 15,100, arrow down and put in the frequency of three, arrow down again, X4 is 13,000. You can arrow down again, but you don't have to because you know that the frequency is going to be one, which is what way. So at this point, we can just stop and calculate the mean. And the way that we calculate the mean is we're going to hit um, stat var. So stat var is just to the left and below the down arrow. And that is what tells the calculator to do some calculations for us. And you'll see that the first thing that it calculates is N, which is the total number of data values. That should say 10. Remember we had 10 data values. So if you did everything right, you should see a 10. But then if you arrow over to X bar, remember X bar stands for the mean of the sample the sample mean. And usually we're going to be doing a sample mean. Actually, this population mean is calculated the same way. Um, so the calculator doesn't have to give you two different options for that. It's just going to give you the one. And so um, when you arrow over to X bar, you should see the um, 17,400, was it? Let me go back a page, sorry. Gotta go all the way back here, let's see. What was our mean that we found when we did this by hand? Yeah, 17,440. So that's what you should see on your calculator. Get back to here. Okay, when you look at X bar. Okay, and then by the way, I don't have it written on the slide, but above the stat var is the exit stat option. If you hit second exit stat, it'll clear out that data that you've entered into your calculator. Now, the reason why I teach uh, my students to use this calculator function rather than doing the table, the tabulated method that we did on the previous slide is only because um, in our class, I emphasize using the calculator to save time. And this doesn't really save time, but <laughs> it will soon because you're going to use the same set of steps to do standard deviations. So that's why I like for my students to know how to enter the data into the calculator and practice it with the mean so that we have that down when we get to the more complicated topic of standard deviation. All right, so now we're gonna talk about the median, which by the way, mean and median and mode are all measures of central tendency. So this is another one. And um, one thing about the uh, mean is it's very sensitive to extreme values. So if you have one value that's like way bigger than the rest of the values, it's gonna throw off the mean quite a bit. Median is not sensitive to that. It's the, it's the middle value in the list. So it's another way of getting a typical data value from the list. And 
knowing both the mean and the median can be really useful. So to find the median of a group of items, we first of all got to always make sure to put them in order. That's what rank the item means, items means. If the number of items is odd, then the medium is going to be the middle number in the list, right? The middle number, there's going to be one less and one more. So the median in this case would be four. And then if the number of items is even, there is no middle number in the list. So you have to actually find the mean of the two in the middle. So whatever's halfway between five and seven in this case. And the way you find that is average them. Five plus seven over two is six. Um, it might be obvious to you at this moment that six is halfway between five and seven, but in a lot of cases, the data values aren't so easy. So what you do is you just add them together and divide by two. Now, there is also a formula. So when you have a very large list of data, many, many, many pieces of data, it's not always easy to see which one's in the middle, right? So the way that you're going to do it is we have a formula for the position. So you have to understand what position means. Position isn't telling you what the median is. It's just telling you where it's located in the list. So in a list of three data values, position two is in the middle. In a list of four data values, positions two and three are in the middle. So what we say is, I'm what I like to say is I'm looking for position two and a half, halfway between two and three. So we can, although we don't have a, an actual formula for finding the median, we do have a formula for calculating what position it would be in which we're going to get to that in just a minute. So let's, let's look at another example of median first. And what it is is 10 students in a math class were polled as to the number of siblings in their individual families and the results were 3, 2, 2, 1, 1, 6, 3, 3, 4, 2. And we're going to find the median number of siblings for the 10 students. Okay, so the way that we're going to do this is first of all put the data in order. This is called ranking the data. Then we're going to look for, um, since there were 10 students, we're going to look for the two, it's an even number, so we have to look for the two data values in the middle. That would be in the fifth and sixth positions, two and three here. And we're gonna find what's halfway between those two values by adding two to three and dividing by two. So that gives us 2.5. So the median of the list was 2.5, but what about the position? How could I know that it's between the fifth and sixth position besides looking at it and counting and trying to figure that out? Well, the way you're gonna do it is you're going to add one to the total number of data values and divide by two, and that's gonna tell you the position that's in the middle. 10 plus one over two is 11 over two, which is five and a half. So we're talking about the five and a half position so when you know when you hear that you can look for which is in the fifth which is in the sixth and find the data value halfway in between so in general if you want to find the position of the median you take the number of data values n plus one and divide it by two and remember the sum of all the frequencies is the same as n the number total number of data values so you could write the formula as the sum of the frequencies plus one divided by two. Very important to realize this is a formula for the position, not the actual value of the median. All right, so let's apply this when we're given the data in a frequency distribution. Remember a frequency distribution is just a list, a table, that has each data value and how many times it occurs, the X's and the F's. I don't know if you can see that, but that's supposed to say X and F. Let me see if I can darken that in. A All right, so here we have, where's my pen? Here it is. We have the X's, the data values, and then we have the F's, the frequencies. All right, so if we want to find the median 
we need the data to be listed first of all ranked which it is because we have one two three four five we have all the data values in order but remember the frequency is telling us that really if I were to list out this data value these data values one at a time I would have one 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 and then four I'm sorry two let's go back and then we'd have two three times two 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 and then we would have three twice and then we would have four six times and so on. So how do we figure out without listing them all out like that, which values in the middle? So what we're going to do is find the position of the median. We're going to find the position of the median by first of all, adding up all the frequencies, four, three, two, six, and eight adds up to 23. And we're going to add one and divide by two. So we get a total of, uh, our, our position of our median is the 12th position. And then now how do we figure out where the 12th position is without listing out all the values? Well, um, notice that the value one, the data value one is in the first, second, third, and fourth position, the first through fourth positions, because there are four of them. Now, which positions would the data value two be in? Well, it'd be in the, that's in the next three, right? So it's going to be in the fifth, sixth, and seventh. To the next two positions, have a three in them, the eighth and ninth. The next six positions, 10 through 15, are going to have fours in them. And the next eight, 16 through 23rd position, have five in them. Now, if you're not sure where I'm getting these values from, notice that if you take the first through fourth, because there's a frequency of four, the next one you add three and you get seventh, so fifth through seventh. That three came from the frequency, right? So what will we add to the seventh? The next one, the two. So that would be eighth and ninth. Then we have to add six to the ninth to get fifteenth, so tenth through fifteenth. And then you have to add the eight to the fifteenth to get the twenty-third, sixteenth through twenty-third. Looking for the number that's in the twelfth position. So which So the median is going to be four because the 12th position is in this grouping, which has a data value of four. So that's how you find the median in a frequency distribution. Okay. Now, mode. Mode is another measure of central tendency. Mode tells you uh, which item occurs the most often. Sometimes a distribution has more than one mode, like two modes. So we call it bimodal. In this class, if it has more than two that are tied for first place, right? More than two that occur the most times, then we just say it doesn't have a mode. Sometimes in other textbooks, they'll have a term for that, but not in our class. We're just going to say either it has a mode or it's bimodal because it has two modes or it just doesn't have a mode. So let's look back at this set of data again for the 10 students polled about the number of siblings in their families. What would the mode be? Now, again, we're not looking for the largest value in the data set. We're looking for the value that is the most. So in this case, we have the most threes. So the mode for the number of siblings is three. How would you find a mode if you're given a frequency distribution? So to find the mode in a frequency distribution, you're just going to look for which one occurs the most times, right? Here again, let me darken this in so maybe you can see it a little bit better. These data values, the X's, these are how often they occur, the frequency, the F's. So which one occurs most frequently? The one that occurs eight times, which is the data value five. So the mode is five since it has the highest frequency, eight. Now when you get into a hurry on the test, it can be easy to write eight instead of five. So make sure you're writing the data value and not how many times it occurs. 
Okay, now let's see if we can use a stem and leaf display to find the mean, median, and mode. So here is a stem and leaf display, and um, we're going to find the median and the mode. It's already ranked, right? So what does that mean? That means everything's in numerical order. Remember we saw in class that what this really means, this first row, for example, is indicating that we have two data values, 15 and 16. And this row is saying that we have a 20, a 27, a 28, a 29, a 29. So this stem is the tens place and these leaves are the ones place. All right, so how do we find the median and the mode? Okay, so um, first of all, to find the median, which I already just showed you what it was, oops, um, we're going to need the, to know how many pieces of data that we actually have, right? So we're going to count. We have 2, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21 pieces of data. So to find the position that's in the middle, the position of the median, do you remember how we did that? We added the number of pieces of data plus 1 divided by 2. So that's going to be 22 over 2, which is 11. So since these are already in order, we can just count up to the 11th position. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So our median is in the 11th position, and it's actually equal to 7. Now, how do I identify the mode? So we're looking for the data value that occurs most frequently. We can see that there are the most 2s. So does that mean that the mode is 2? No, actually, it means that the mode is 42, right? Because this is a stem and leaf. Uh, diagram, we have to remember the tens place to be included. All right. Now, how about the mean? So let's go ahead and use our calculator to calculate mean. Um, you should find that you end up getting a 37.5. What you want to do is you want to enter the data value x1. First of all, you're going to go to second at Actually, before that, second exit stat to clear out the data that we did a little while ago. Then you're going to go second stat, and then um, you're going to select one var. In this class, we're only doing one variable statistics, so um, it's always going to be one var. But in other classes, you will get to a point where you do uh, two variable statistics as well. But in any case, one var, and then you have to hit the data and then it'll ask you for x1, you put 15. It'll ask you for x2, you put 16. Oh, wait, what's after x1, you arrow down, it's going to ask you the frequency. That occurs once. The frequency of 16 is also once. You just arrow down. x3 is going to be 20, which also has a frequency of 1, so you can just keep arrowing down x4 is going to be 27, also a frequency of 1, arrow down. x5 is 28, frequency of 1, arrow down. x6, though, is 29, which occurs twice. So the frequency would actually be 2, so you would change that before you arrow down. Continue in this way. After you've entered all the data values, then you're going to go to... Um, what was it? Stat var. Okay, and you're going to select X bar, and you should get 37.5. So if you're watching the recording of this, pause and make sure you can get that same result. But I'm going to continue on. Okay, and we're going to look at a set of data and compare the mean, median, and mode and see how, 
how they're the same, what this tells us about the data. So here I have a set of data. It says the following scores are earned by 15 college students on a 20 point math quiz. Calculate the mean, median, and mode scores. I which measure in part A is most representative of the data. So we have 0, 1, 1, 11, 11, 12, 14, 14, 15, 15, 18, 18, 18, 19, and 20. All right, so the mean, if you add up all those values and divide by the number of, of students, which is 15, you get 12.5. The median's position can be found by adding 15 plus 1 over 2. So that tells you that it's in the eighth position. If you look for the eighth position, because this data is already in order, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, that's a 14 is the position in the middle. And then the mode is 18. 18 is the score that occurred most frequently. It happened three times. So you can see there's a lot of different information here. The mean, the median, and the mode. Here are the actual data values. 0, 1, 11, 12, 14, 14, 15, uh, 14, 14, 15, 15, uh, 18, 18, 18, 19, and 20, okay? The median is around here, the mean is over here, and the mode is way up here. All right, so which value do you think is most representative of the data? So it looks to me like the mean was... Uh, these values way down here, 0, 1, and 1, are kind of outliers. So those are people that maybe weren't really trying. <laughs> so we want to pay more attention to the people who are actually um, making an effort on this. And uh, they're kind of grouped up here. You can see they're way off from the others. In, doesn't it look like the median is more towards the center of this grouping than either the mode or the mean? And so um, it looks to me like the mean was thrown off kind of low because it takes into consideration the 0, 1, and the 1. Um, and the mode, it just so happens uh, three people got a relatively high score, but um, on average that's not kind of how people really scored. So it looks to me like the median is kind of the most representative um, of the data. So it's good to have all three because it gives you an idea of what's going on with the data. All right, I want to very briefly mention some terms. Um, when we analyze data, sometimes we look at the distribution, um, how spread out the data is, and we like to look at histograms to show a picture of that. Sometimes the data is symmetric, sometimes it's not symmetric. Symmetric means that it's pretty much a mirror image on each side of the middle. So here we have some examples of symmetric distributions. Each one of these is still different. They're all, they all have their own unique qualities. The one on the left is the uniform distribution. Everybody has, every data values occurs with the same frequency is what that's showing. Um, the binomial distribution in the middle has like a shape to it. It's very few at the low ends of the data, very few at the high ends, more in the middle. And then here's an example of a bimodal distribution where we had two modes, right? Two data values that occurred most frequently. But it's symmetric because it's the same uh, uh, shape on each half of the middle. All right, some non-symmetric distributions can uh, are skewed to the left or skewed to the right. Skewed to the left looks like a J, and skewed to the right looks like an L. And then there's another one that's just messy, <laughs> that's also non-symmetric. All right, so that's the end of Chapter 6, Section 2, and then we're going to look at Chapter 6, Section 3 for a little bit. So let's get started on that. Okay, so, um, oops. I don't know why I'm in the middle of my slide, Joe. Push, push the wrong button. Okay, so we're still in chapter six. We're finished with six one and six two, and now we're moving on to 
Six three measures of dispersion. So instead of talking about what data values are kind of in the middle, we're talking about how spread out the data is. Measures of dispersion. So some measures of dispersion are range and standard deviation. We're going to talk about those two measures, standard deviation being the most important, which will apply quite a bit in uh, upcoming sections. Um, and then how to interpret those measures. And we'll also briefly introduce the concept of coefficient of variation if we have time. So sometimes we wanna look at how spread out data is or the dispersion. And as I've already mentioned, range and standard deviation are two of the measures. So what is range? Range is the easiest way to measure how spread out data is. All you do is take the greatest value in the set minus the least value in the set. So for example, if this is our set of data, what would the range be? Be 5 minus 1 equals 4 or 10 minus 2 equals 8? So the answer to that question is that when we're talking about range, greatest data value, not the frequency. So we're looking at the X's. Let me make sure you can see which column is X. Not the F's. We're concerned only about the data values, the X's. So we're going to subtract 5 minus 1, and we see that the data is uh, pretty close together. They're all uh, between the value one and the value five. So they're only, their spread is only four units apart. Okay, to see um, what effect knowing the range could have, what it helps us understand about a data set. Here's a very simple example of two data sets that actually have the same mean and median. They both have a mean and median of seven. So if that's all you know about the sets, you think they're pretty much the same, right? But in fact, if you find the range, you see that set A has a range of 12 and set B has a range of only four. So, so set B is more clustered closely around seven, whereas set A is spread out. Now let's talk about standard deviation. One of the most useful measures of version is standard deviation and it's based on deviations from the mean of a data set. So what I've done here is drawn a picture of a data set that contains the value 1, 2, 8, 11, and 13. It's just got five values in the set. This is not supposed to be a histogram or even a bar chart. This is a visual representation of the size of each data value and the mean of this set is and so that red line, which I hope you can see, let me, there's a red line drawn across here. It's kind of small. That line is showing you where seven would be. So again, if all the data values were seven, we'd have a mean of seven, but we also get a mean of seven when the amount that they're above seven is equal to the amount that they're below seven, which is what's happening here. The deviation to how much above or below they are. A deviation is negative if it's below the average. So if you take the data value minus seven and get a negative, that's because it was below average. Like one is six units below. So its deviation is negative six. And then if you look at a data value that is bigger than average, it's gonna have a positive deviation when you subtract like 13 minus seven is positive six. So what we do is we would like to find the average of the deviations. And here I've created a chart with those same data values and we show their deviations in a separate column, X minus X bar. It's hard to see the X bar here. Let me see if I can fix. So we have X minus X bar. And the problem is, is that by the very nature of the average, the, the amount that the uh, numbers, the data values are above average equals to the amount they're below average. So if you add them together, you get zero. So how can we possibly average the deviations? So um, what we would like to do is just say, oh, okay, let's just use the positive of these numbers. But for reasons uh, that have to do with the study of statistics and how algebra plays in, it just, it doesn't work well to just say, take the positive version or value. So what we do instead is uh, unfortunate, but it's what we had to do is to square these numbers.
to get rid of the negatives so that when we average them, we don't get an average of zero because that doesn't really tell us anything. We'd like to know on average, how much does an individual piece of data differ from the mean? We need to average the positive versions of these numbers. So there's something called the variance, which we get by adding up the squares of the differences between the, the data value and the mean. In other words, we're adding up the squares of the deviations. We divide that number n minus 1 when we're talking about a sample rather than dividing by n which would be a true average because we're allowing a little wiggle room for error but you don't need to worry about that all you need to know in our class is that we square the deviations and find their average by dividing by n minus 1 so negative 6 6, negative 5 squared is 25, 1 squared is 1, 4 squared is 16, 6 squared is 36. Okay, so we have these five values and we want to know how much, what they're, a, a kind of average of them. And so what we do is we add them all up and then we're going to divide, that gives us 114 by the way, and then we're going to divide by n minus 1, the number of data values um, minus 1, which in this case is 5 minus 1, so 4. So 114 divided by 4 gives us a variance of 28. Now that's like an average of the squares of the deviations, but we want the average of the deviations. So what we do is we just take the square root of that number that we just found, the square root of the variance. So the square root of 28.5, which is about 5.34. So what this number represents is the amount a typical piece of data differs from the mean, and it's called the standard deviation. We use the letter S to represent the standard deviation if it's a sample, and we use the letter sigma to represent the standard deviation if it's the whole population. When it's the whole population, though, we just divide by n instead of n minus 1. We don't need as much wiggle room because we have all the information about the population. So notice that most of the data fall within 5.34 units of the mean, right? Well, that makes sense because we're saying the amount a typical piece of data differs from the mean. So here's the formula for standard deviation. And as I've mentioned in class, these statistics formulas are not like algebra formulas. You're not just plugging in a value for each missing variable. This is describing a procedure. Sigma means to add up. So we're adding up the, the squares of all the differences. And then we're going to divide that number by n minus 1 and take the square root. I also want to emphasize that in my class, I'm not going to force you to work it out by hand. You can work it out by hand, but that's going to take a lot longer than using the calculator. So I'm going to show you both, but um, my emphasis is on just using the standard deviation, not on calculating it by hand. Okay, but just for, so you know, the procedure for calculating the standard deviation by hand is just what we just did. One, you're going to create a table with columns for data deviations and squares of deviations. Then you're going to list the data and find the sum and the average or mean of the data. Then you're going to calculate the deviations. That just means the data value minus the mean. And then square those and find the sum. Divide the sum by n minus 1. Square root. And you have the standard deviation. If you're watching the recording of this video and you want to, you can always pause the video to write down the steps. But now I'm going to show you how it works. All right, so let's say that we wanted to calculate the mean and the standard deviation of this sample of data by hand. So we have 51, 63, 77, 75, 78, 84, and 90. The first thing we need to do is make a table. In your table, you're going to write down your data values. 51, 63, 75, 77, 78, 84, and 90. And then we also, before we can 
create the next column. The next column in our table has to be x minus x bar, the difference between the data value and the mean. So we need the mean. So you calculate the mean, which turns out if you add them all up, you get 518. Divide by n, you get 7. The mean of the data values, x bar, is 74. So the next column is going to be each one of the data values minus 74. You often get negatives here. Right? Anytime the data is below the mean, you get a negative. 51 minus 74 is negative 23, for example. So you find that difference, subtracting 74 from each data value. And remember, we want to know how much the deviations typically are. So we're looking for an a type of average of the deviations. But those, those will always add up to zero. In fact, you can even add them up and check whether your arithmetic is right. If you add up this column, you should always get zero. All right, so instead we're going to work with the squares of the deviations. So here I have squared each deviation. So like negative 23 squared turns out to be 529. 1032 divided by 6 turns out to be 172, and the square root of that is about 13.1 in my class. So um, the first thing, this is just like what we did to find the mean. The steps are virtually identical. So you're going to first clear any data by hitting second and then the stat var button, which is exit stat. Okay, now you wanna enter your data. So you hit second and then the data button, so second stat, and you're going to see one var on the screen. You hit enter and then you hit the data button again, but this time without hitting second. Now you're gonna enter your data values, which by the way, on this list, they all they all occur with a frequency of one. They each only occur once. So you're going to hit enter x1 equals 51, arrow down, arrow down. x2 equals 63, arrow down, arrow down. You enter all data values. And then once you have them all entered, the next step is to calculate the standard deviation. So what you do is you hit stat var, which is here. But then you're going to have to arrow over to where it says SX, not sigma X, because that would be for a population. And we were told that this is sample data. And there is a slight difference in the calculation of the sample standard deviation from the uh, population standard deviation sigma. So you're going to arrow over to SX so that it's underlined. And then you're going to hit enter. And you should see the standard deviation on the screen, which we found was, am I remembering this correctly, 13.1? Let's go back for a sec. Yeah, 13.1. So you should get the same um, standard deviation that way, which is a lot easier, right? So you want to practice entering this in your calculator. OK, so. Um, here's a little chance to test yourself. This is a homework item from my math lab. They give you the values and the frequency. I do want to point out uh, one of the reasons I show this slide is because this, this error does occur from time to time in um, my math lab. So notice that really this data value 6 should not be on the list, technically, <laughs> because it's not it occurs with a frequency of zero. We don't list data values that occur with a frequency of zero. Um, the only effect that has is on the range. So the range should be five minus two. Oops, that looks terrible. Hold on. The range is the largest data value in the set minus the smallest. So it should be five minus two. And I believe when I looked in uh, my math lab, they did six minus two as four which doesn't make sense, of course. So just ignore that. So it really should have been. Um, and if you see this happen, just send me an Ask My Instructor email because um, I have a little button on my end that says Ask the Publisher, and I can ask them to fix it. All right, but this should have been uh, 5 minus 2 equals 3 for the range. And then standard deviation will not be affected because um, we always take the frequency into consideration. So you can just ignore that and just work with this. So if you're doing this at home, try entering this in your calculator. 
find the standard deviation. And right now, you better pause the video because I'm about to tell you the answer. So if you don't want to hear it, pause the video and try working it on your own. And the answer is 1.0. Now, you might have put 0.9 if you didn't round correctly, but it actually should round to 1.0. Oh, because I believe it's 0.9 something five or higher, so you have to round up. Okay, so just so that you, uh, I've sort of hinted around about this, but the formula for the population standard deviation differs from the formula for the sample standard deviation. These are both missing the exponent here. This should be squared. Okay, that's better. All right, so... Um, Population standard deviation, um, we only divide by n, not n minus 1, because we have all the information about the population and there's no kind of, um, there's less of an error, basically, in our calculation. So when we're trying to uh, find the amount a typical piece of data differs from the mean, if we don't have all the information, then we might we don't want to guess too narrow of a guess. So we only divide by n minus 1, which gives us a bigger value because you're dividing by a smaller number. So it allows more wiggle room. Whereas with sigma, where we're dividing by the entire, the whole value n, you get a narrower interpretation of the standard deviation. You get a smaller uh, number. So you know with more certainty that the data is closer simply because you have all the data. So if I ask you which formula gives you a larger result, you would say the sample one does because you're dividing by a smaller number, n minus one. And when you look on your calculator in the uh, stat bar screen, it's going to give you an sx and a sigma x, and it will always be the case that sigma x is a slightly smaller number. For example, with the set of data 51, 63, 77, 75, 78, 84, and 90, the sx is 13.11, the sample standard deviation, whereas sigma x is 12.1. And do you remember what type of statistics draws conclusions about a population from sample data? Do you remember what we called that? That was one of the terms from the first day of statistics chapter, and that was inferential statistics. So that's a good term to know. Inferential statistics draws conclusions about a population from sample data. So here we are going to compare two companies A and B that sell small packs of sugar for coffee. The mean and standard deviation for samples from each company are given below. So like we went to a factory each factory and we picked out some samples and we calculated the mean and standard deviation of the amount of sugar in each of the packets. So first of all, which company tends to provide more sugar in their packets? So let's see, company A has a mean amount of sugar of 1.013 teaspoons. Company B has a mean amount of sugar of 1.07 teaspoons. So on average, it appears that company A provides more sugar. It has a greater mean amount of sugar, right, in each packet. Which company fills its packs more consistently? So that is a question about standard deviation, how spread out the results are. Company A it varied by 0.0021, whereas company B, it varied by 0.0018. Which has more of, which one varies more from the average? That would be uh, company A. Company B then fills its packs more consistently. You, it's more reliably about a teaspoon, right, than company A. It varies a, a lot more from packet to packet. All right, we already talked about that. All right, another use of standard deviation has to do with this amazing formula that um, a mathematician known as Chebyshev came up with. It says that for any set of numbers, 
regardless of how they're distributed. This is going to be really important to us later. It might not kind of have the impact that it should right now because we haven't really talked about the importance of something called the normal distribution. But this particular formula um, is really amazing because it doesn't matter how the numbers are distributed. Um, if they're really spread out, really close together, it doesn't matter. No matter what, the fraction of them that lie within k standard deviations of their mean is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. So in other words, if I said, what's the minimum percentage of the items in a data set that lie within three standard deviations of the mean, you would know that it would be 1 minus 1 over 3 squared, at least. So this is the minimum number. So that would be 1 minus a ninth or 8 ninths, or if you divide that out, 0.889, which is 88.9%. So let's say that the standard, dev let's say that we have a data set, and the data set has a mean of 10, and it has a standard deviation of 5. What it means to be within three standard deviations, I find it easier to understand that on, if I draw the data on a number line. So here's the number 10, that's in the middle, that's the mean. And standard deviation of five means that one standard deviation above the mean would be 15, two standard deviations above would be 20, three would be 25. Below the mean, we would have uh, five, zero, and negative five probably should have picked a different value because I don't want to throw you off with the negatives, but you can have negative data values. So in any case, if the mean is 10, within three standard deviations is somewhere between negative 5 and 25 because one standard deviation is 5. So we're saying that if the mean is 10 and the standard deviation is 5, 88.9% of the data is going to be between negative 5 and 25, at least maybe more, maybe 100%, but definitely not less, not 75%, not 50%. So we do know something about um, relative to the mean, how spread out the data can be by as far as per number of standard deviations. Okay, here's an example of a type of homework question you might have about Chebyshev's theorems. It says, in a certain distribution, the mean is 70 with a standard deviation of 5. At least what fraction of the numbers between the following are between the following pair of numbers? So I'm going to, we're going to see later why I draw the picture the way that I do. But what I always do is I draw a number line, and let's pretend that this is like a histogram, except instead of drawing rectangles like this, I just draw a, a smooth curve. But it's the same idea. The height represents the frequency of the data, how many times each data value occurs, right? And so, um, 70 is right in the middle, that's the mean. And then since there's a standard deviation of five, then if I go up five to 75, I'm one standard deviation above the mean. If I go down five to 65, I'm one standard deviation below the mean. The mean is there, and then we have 65 and 75. Let's see, I'm gonna erase my scratch here. There we go. All right, that's one standard deviation away from the mean. But that's not 60 to 80. We want to talk about 60 to 80. So we have to go out one standard deviation further and talk about the data between 60 and 80. Those are within two standard deviations of the mean. So if I ask you at least what fraction of the numbers are between 60 and 80, I'm really asking you what fraction are within two standard deviations of the mean. And we can answer that using Chebyshev's theorem. We know that it's 1 minus 1 over k squared, which is 1 minus 1 over 2 squared, or 1 minus a fourth, which is 3 fourths, or 75% of the data is within two standard deviations of the mean. 
So what we had to do was when they gave us a spread, 60 to 80, we had to look at the mean and the standard deviation and can figure out how many standard deviations away from the mean we were on either side in order to be able to use Chebyshev's theorem. Another concept which we're just going to touch on is the coefficient of variation. Um, it expresses the standard deviation as a percentage of the mean, which is kind of good because if a standard deviation is 5, that doesn't really tell you much unless you know how big the data value was. Like the, if the average data value is 1,000 and the standard deviation is only 5, that means the data is not very spread out, right? But if the standard deviation is 5 and the mean is 10, then that means the data is pretty far away from 10. So in order to kind of um, take into consideration the size of the data, then um, we express the, uh, we use the standard deviation and the mean to calculate the coefficient of variation. So what you do is you take the standard deviation, divide it by the mean to figure out what portion of the mean it covers and multiply by 100. So here's how this helps. Let's say we wanna compare the dispersions in the two samples of scores on two different standardized tests. Test A has scores of 12, 13, 16, 18, 18, and 20. Test B, 125, 131, 144, 158, 168, and 193. So it's like comparing apples and oranges, right? Very different um, scoring possibilities. But we want to compare how the two different test results were. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the coefficient of variation. So we're going to calculate V, which is the standard deviation divided by X bar. So um, it turns out that if you calculate the mean for test A, you're going to get 16.167. For um, the sample standard deviation of test A, you're going to get 3.125. And if you take 3.125 divided by 16.167 and multiply by 100, you get about 19.3. For test B, the mean is 153-ish. The standard deviation turns out to be 25.29-ish. If you divide those and multiply it by 100, you get 16.5. So this is sort of telling you what percentage of the mean the standard deviation represents. So even though the standard deviation for test A was only 3, since the scores for test A were so much smaller, 3 was more significant. So the coefficient of variation is 19.3, whereas for test B, the standard deviation looks huge, right? It's 25, but that's really a not as big of a percentage of the mean. So when you take into consideration how big the scores are, that coefficient of variation is only 16.5. So really, relative to the data values uh, for my